the um, classic ketogenic diet is a ratio-based diet, and it's um, prescribed in ratios that range from two to one to four to one. Usually kids get up to a four to one diet, sometimes a 3.5 to one diet. And what that ratio um, refers to is the ratio of fat to proteins and carbohydrates combined. And these diets are very carefully calculated by dietitians. Many of you sit in this room. And uh, those calculations are based on age, sex, uh, weight and height, as well as the activity level of the child, recognizing that a child who um, is more physically active um, has different caloric needs than a child who is perhaps um, in a wheelchair. And just to give a uh, kind of gross comparison, and I know for the dietitians in the room that this is gross, um, not gross like that, you know, non-specific. Um, if you compare a typical diet to the classic ketogenic diet, you'll see that um, our typical kind of North American diet is predominantly made up of carbohydrates, whereas the classic ketogenic diet is usually based on about 90% on fat. So it's really kind of a flip. And that's shown here just in these pie charts with uh, blue being fat. Um, there's a lot of fat in the classic diet. <laughs> And actually, this is just a sample daily menu. If there were people here who didn't know what it looked like to eat a classic ketogenic diet, this is just an example. So breakfast could include an egg frittata, which would be um, a mix of egg, butter, and cream, really, maybe with some uh, small portion of a vegetable mixed in. Lunch could be a skinless chicken breast with a good serving of mayo and oil added in for the fat. An after-school snack could be veggies and dip with a small amount of carrot and a larger amount of mayo with some flavoring added in. So each meal, you're getting the picture here, right, has a little bit of uh, protein and a lot of fat. Um, a bedtime snack there could be some sugar-free jello mixed um, kind of whipped up with cream so that you get the fat in. And it's important in the classic diet, for example, here that uh, this child is getting five meals a day because when you're feeding um, predominantly on fat, you need to ensure that you have regular adequate doses of fats to keep up energy and to keep up ketone production. So you can't have the last meal of the day be dinner. And actually the truth is most of us with children know most kids have another snack or meal after dinner anyway. So it's not really a problem to have five smaller meals a day as opposed to three meals a day. Here's pictures stolen off the internet again, just showing that uh, the ketogenic diet can look nice and there's different ways to prepare it. So in a, essentially in a starch-free diet, you're not getting things like bread, but that doesn't have to stop you from eating lunch meat with mayo, you just have to use the lunch meat as the outer wrapping. Um, and certainly this afternoon we're going to have demonstrations on cooking that will probably show much nicer than this all the different things you can do with a ketogenic diet. So I've talked so far about uh, classic ketogenic diet being delivered as food. You can also deliver it in the form of a liquid only diet and we're going to learn this afternoon how you can use the formula based uh, food also to cook with but um, it's important to realize that if a child is fed by a tube or young enough that they're still drinking from a bottle that the diet can be given as a formula only and that can be done um, in a modular way, building up a liquid from a variety of products, or you can use one of the prepackaged formulas that are available here and that Nutritia is telling us about today. Um, and so, for example, here there's a 4.4 to 1 uh, product. Now, I know there's a 3 to 1 product, but I don't think we have it here. Is that right? That's correct. So, um, you can modify the 4 to 1 product, though, um, to allow you to do different ratios. So who do we, who should try the ketogenic diet? Well, right now we prescribe the ketogenic diet for children with epilepsy that is not controlled by medication, as I discussed. Um, I consider that um, children should be uh, evaluated for surgery at the same time that they're evaluated for diet therapy. And the reason for that is that we're all here to talk today about 
how many lives can be helped by using diets for epilepsy, but truthfully, surgery for epilepsy is a very important treatment um, and often can offer a cure for epilepsy when medication and diet can't in the right people with the right type of epilepsy. So when I'm referred a child for diet treatment, I also do a little bit of a surgical evaluation, which means maybe a couple extra tests just to sort out uh, whether they might also be a candidate for surgery and so that I can talk to that family about all the different options that they have available to them to treat their child's epilepsy. We also spend a fair bit of time talking to families about the commitment of using diet therapy for epilepsy. Um, it's certainly far more changing to the household than prescribing another medication, and many of you understand what I mean by that. There needs to be a strong willingness to commit the time and effort required to make sure that the diet is done very precisely, um, and that the family and the child need to understand the consequences of the change in the lifestyle, and that you, can't, you need to fully embrace it. So you can't kind of start the ketogenic diet, um, and you can't just come off it for a day that you happen to have a birthday party. Once started, it's a strong commitment, and there is some danger in suddenly coming off the diet. So you really need to have a strong commitment. But one of the interesting features is that the diet can be used regardless of seizure type or epilepsy syndrome or underlying etiology of epilepsy. So it really, despite maybe some early literature that suggested it didn't work for partial seizures and that kind of thing, really the diet is effective for almost all seizure types. And there are a couple of conditions in which, in which uh, diet therapy should be considered uh, first-line therapy, and those are diseases in which the actual cause of the epilepsy is an inability to use carbohydrates as a fuel for the brain. So obviously it makes sense that we would provide another fuel in the, in the form of fats. And I, I mentioned right at the beginning, actually, why would we not uh, always just use a diet first? And really that's because of some of the issues I mentioned around this change in lifestyle for a family, and also because, like medications, diet therapies have serious consequences and serious complications. So I usually, when I talk to families, divide up the complications of the ketogenic diets into the acute, or things that could happen right away that we need to watch for right away and things that, chronic things, uh, complications that can occur over time. So among the acute complications of the ketogenic diet are things that um, uh, are uh, an effect of taking away glucose and making the body use fat. Children can become acidotic, they can become dehydrated, they can have uh, low blood sugar, and associated with those conditions, they can be lethargic and, and have vomiting. And when kids are admitted to start the ketogenic diet, we teach parents and other caregivers about how to look for these things and how to treat them um, and how to monitor for them. The chronic complications of the ketogenic diet are also listed there. Some of them involve the nutritional deficiencies that we do make up by giving vitamins and other supplements while they're treated with the diet, but for whatever reason, we can't make it up exactly in the way that nature intended it to be. So we see, um, we see osteoporosis or bone loss. We see poor linear growth. Kids don't grow as tall while they're on the diet. The good news about that is that once they come off the diet, they catch up in growth. We have a wonderful example of that sitting in the middle of the room today. And um, some of the other uh, chronic, const chronic uh, complications are listed there, including kidney stones, constipation, um, obviously blood uh, lipids go up, elevated cholesterol and triglycerides. Um, bleeding abnormalities, I think, is important because we don't talk too much about it, but we do see a fair bit of bruising. I've had a couple children who sometimes, um, even um, in the face of having normal numbers of platelets, seem to have a more tendency to bleed, and that's something we need to just remember to look for. The reason I wrote immune deficiency with a question mark is because I, I'm, I'd welcome other people's comments on this. Um, it's kind of in the literature, but I, I can't find a lot of evidence for it. Dr. Kossoff's shaking his head. You'll talk about it? People talk about it, but I can't find it. And I, I haven't had anybody have any immune, like any overwhelming infections or anything while on the diet. So I think it's, we're probably safe on that one despite what's a little bit discussed in the literature. And um, there are a f very rare cases in which we really just say, no, we cannot put this person on the diet, this child on the diet. That includes, obviously, if your body can't metabolize fats, then this is not a good diet. Um, also, if there is very 
um, resistant to treatment aspiration or choking and the diet can't be swallowed safely, then we wouldn't use the diet. In that case, we could look at a feeding tube to deliver the diet um, and that's something that we do. Um, and uh, lastly, if a child, because epilepsy is associated uh, with osteoporosis and then on top of that, some children who are non-ambulatory are more at risk for osteoporosis, some children come to us to be evaluated from the diet already with very weak bones already with having had stress fractures, and a child like that, I don't think really it's fair to put them on the, on the diet and have that be exacerbated. How effective is this diet? Well, we're all sitting here because this works for children with intractable epilepsy, and it certainly does. Um, I, rather than review all the literature for you, I think we can truly summarize by saying that about 50% of children have more than a 50% reduction in seizures, um, and up to 25% have a 90% reduction in seizures. And so if you think about Sam and Mary, he was having 10, 20, 30, some days 100 seizures a day. Um, a 90% reduction means he could go to school. You know, a 50% reduction means he can spend part of his day awake. It makes an enormous difference. 75% of people that use these diets are able to reduce their medications, and that helps to limit some of the cognitive um, and other and behavioral side effects of the medications. Uh, Margaret made reference to Dr. Neal and Dr. Cross's work with uh, a randomized controlled trial looking at uh, the ketogenic diet, and uh, that study, um, just to review it quickly, um, was a big study of 145 children entering this study and 103 that were available for the analysis that continued on. So just one of the points that they brought forward at uh, their mean seizure frequency at three months in the treatment group, 38% uh, had reduced their seizures and 37% in the control group had increased their seizures. So a, a really dramatic difference. Interestingly, we also uh, know that effect of the ketogenic diet and efficacy of the ketogenic diet may be related to uh, what medication uh, you take. And uh, in this uh, single study by Morrison, uh, they found that actually starting the diet on phenobarbital may make the diet less effective. It's kind of interesting. I start the diet on lots of kids on phenobarbital, but it may me suggest that we should consider weaning the phenobarbital sooner rather than later. And you can't always stop a medication just because you're starting the diet because that medication may be saving them from really life-threatening seizures, but it's something to consider. And we also know the ketogenic diet can work really fast. So Dr. Kossoff's uh, work here uh, with Dr. Nordley, they looked at 118 children and 84% of their sample had a reduction in seizures and the median time to first improvement was five days. So that means we admit children to start the diet. We usually admit them on a Monday. We send them home Thursday or Friday. So that means within the admission, and this is true to our experience as well, we often see reduction in seizures within the first few days of the starting the diet and the first few days of seeing ketones. It's very dramatic. 75% of those kids improved within 14 days. There was some talk mentioned as well about early use of the ketogenic diet. And I do maintain, and this is my practice, but I know that others may have different practices, but I do maintain that children with epilepsy should be tried on medication first. There's lots of reasons for that. Um, but we do know that it can work when used early. And when I see a child who's failed medication, I try as fast as I can to get them on the diet when it's appropriate. Uh, this study by Rubenstein et al, um, reported on 13 children that used the ketogenic diet after being either on one anticonvulsant medication or no anticonvulsant medications. Um, 10 of those children were still on the diet at six months, and 60% had had a, a more than 90% reduction in their seizures. So you don't have to have failed drugs for it to be appropriate, for it to be effective, I think is the message there. Um, at 12 months, six of the children were still on the diet and all of them had had a really dramatic effect. Of course, that's why they were still on the diet. Presumably those that didn't have it.